I'll tell you who's a power couple, Tim and Steph Gordon. And I thank the Lord that they're in our church mm. because the books that they're putting out are cutting edge. This is exactly, the, they put their finger right on the problem. They know exactly what's wrong with our society. They've already written several books. And now this one, Leave and Cleave, Nine Marriage Prep Secrets, Once Taught, Now Censored. So, Tim and Steph, so does this book show how patriarchy works? That's the first question. And didn't both of you already do that with uh, the book, The Case for Patriarchy, and ask your husband, is this kind of just a repeat? It's not, because Case for Patriarchy and Ask Your Husband tended to proving the theoretical, not just plausibility, but necessity of patriarchy uh, for, for, for him and for her, respectively. They're just two theoretical books. And that kind of set everything on fire five and four years ago, respectively. And then people took a year or two and then got hip to it. And now everyone's like, oh, I guess Tim and Steph were right. Matt, Matt Frad said um, to, I think, Trent Horn's wife, wow, I guess Steph really had it right. She convinced me. Uh, I guess he can't oh, say, say wow. my name or something, but yeah, he said she's like the prophet of marriage. So now everyone's got it, or at least people that aren't insane left cats, the normies and the middle cats have got it. And now they're trying to implement patriarchy in their marriage. And because of all the, you know, whatever, eight, nine, 10 decades of feminism, they don't know, they don't have the manual. So this book tends to uh, the, the nine very specific truths of, okay, how, how autonomous should a marriage be? Should it really be like your own island just with you and your wife and your kids? We say yes. Uh, how, you know, how, what should sex be like? How important is sex? How important is fun between you and a wife? That's number three. How, um, what are proper male and female roles? What are proper husband and wife and uh, father and mother roles? Those are chapters four and five. Then in chapter six, we deal with the very important specific question of spousal bad mouthing, which all the feminism has um, generated over the last eight or nine decades. Because husbands who are cucked or long housed will always bad mouth their wives because they, they know that they're supposed to be the leader and they're not doing it. And their wives always bad mouth them. Um, chapter seven and eight, we, we deal with um, the prospect of child rearing and homeschooling. And in seven specifically, getting out of arguments, we actually give a template. We give recitals for how to get wow. out of arguments and to tend to them. And then chapter nine, we just say, um, here's how you truly put the other spouse first. The number one person in the world, even over your kids, is your spouse. Here's how you do it very specifically. It's all specific, specific, specific. And the church has taught this for 19 centuries, but it's utterly gone away from it and is actually bracketing the scriptures which teach you how to do it and saying don't read this at mass and and um saying you know you know trying to get people like us in trouble for going back to her wisdom <laughs> yeah bracket ephesians chapter five right in the lectionary literally and, and other passages because i guess women can't handle what our lord expects of us i guess that's the critique right like women we're so flighty and emotional that we can't hear scripture when God's like, your husband is your boss. So it's just, it's so, it's actually so insulting that they hide scripture from women because they think we can't handle it. Like good Catholics can handle scripture. Trust me. I, I've changed my entire life for the Lord. So. <laughs> Amen. Talking to uh, Tim and Steph Gordon, their new book, uh, leave and cleave nine marriage prep secrets. Once taught now censored, you can get the book. TimothyJGordon.com, all lowercase, TimothyJGordon.com. So the book is on pre-order for publication. And I guess it's you're also teaching this as a class, right, Tim, starting September 11th, right? Yeah, we have the pub date for the book is September the 11th. We don't know exactly when it will arrive at your doorstep, but it should be a little before that, we're hoping. The class is called the One Flesh Marriage Class, and it's nine courses long, beginning September 11th on Wednesday nights. It's not just for, for newlyweds or for people that are engaged. It's for people that have been married 10, 20, 30, 40 years, because we go through these nine lessons, the nine chapters of the book, considered a textbook. You get the book for the class, the class for the book. And most people in the last decades just weren't given a proper marriage prep class, or if they had to, to get married in the church, they were actually told the contraries of what you need to do to win. They were, they were sold the main pack of Catholic lies 
called mutual submission, which is a false anti-gospel that the church has been teaching for six or seven decades. And that lands you in all the hot water that marriage today is, which is why Catholics divorce, divorce is roughly the same rate as everyone else. They're, they're running this feminine uh, feminism psyop that the secular world is, and it's called mutual submission. It's an utter lie. And again, you don't just need to know how to say patriarchy. You need to know how it works. The class one flesh begins September 11th. You can also enroll for that now on timothyjgordon.com and, and buy the book there while you're at it. Cause it's the textbook for the course, nine classes, nine chapters. That, uh, Tim, I guess they get that mutual submission, uh, that interpretation they draw it from Ephesians 5 21 but they misinterpret it because they, they don't read the other verses right beneath where it talks about the order of marriage. They'll just take that one verse where it says, I think something like, uh, you know, and, uh, to each other what it's due. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 21, but then 22, it gives the order of that relationship, but they just isolate that one verse where it talks about mutual submission and Mm -hmm. they, they basically just, cherry pick it and have built the whole theology around that. Correct. Right. Cause it's really what scripture is saying is like submit to each other. What is due. Right. So I'm not, he, I, he, you can't, he can't give me what isn't his to give. Like he has to give me what the Lord says he has to give me and same for me to him. So it's, it is kind of, I always think of it at like as an exchange, so to speak, like if you use the analogy of like this item costs $50, I give you the $50 and I get this item back. They're not, you're not giving each other $50, you know, it's not just going back and forth. I'm giving something and I'm getting a different thing in return. That's what it's saying. It's very clear that women owe their husband's respect and humility and, and submission yeah. and obedience. And husbands have to lay down their lives for their wives and to love them and to protect them. That's that's the exchange of what's yeah. owed. It's it's far worse, Jesse, than just cherry picking. That would be mildly dishonest. What the advocates of mutual submission have done is precisely what Martin Luther did in Romans when he added the word um, solo, oh, oh, you mm-hmm. the only scripture. They added the word mutual which is impossible. They, they, that word does not appear in the in Bible. The now, if, oh, wow. Yeah, they just added, they, um, they, unfortunately, it's John Paul II just made up the word mutual. They're, that word does not appear in the Bible. It's, if, if you see two basketball teams playing in the championship, one has to win, one has to lose. Now, if you say, which is what St. Paul says in verse 21, in a sense, not a mutual sense, because that would be identical, in a sense, Both teams kind of win. The winner literally wins and the loser of the championship game can, can gain life lessons from losing, right? They can't mutually identically win though, that only one team can win. Literally only one person in a marriage submits literally. And St. Paul makes that absolutely clear. The woman has to submit to her husband in everything. He says it the very next verse, the only, and that would be, it would be an impossibility have a mutual submission because that means literally both teams have more points when time expires if you see a head-on collision one goes up one goes under that's to submit or to be subjective a a husband submits his life in if they're attacked by a band of robbers on the road that's the only sense it's a it's a figurative sense in which he submits the wife submits literally only one team can have more points when the time expires only one can actually submit or be thrown under the rule of the other it's a you lot. And Pope John Paul II, he uh, he wrote about this, and and he wasn't as clear as you guys are right now. You guys are very clear in in, in interpreting this based on the tradition of the church, <laughs> and and he he did have more of a modernist view of this. Much he, he wanted to, he wanted to create a uh, Christian feminism. We I don't have the same view of Pope John Paul II that um, some people out there do. He. <laughs> Kissed the Quran. He called Vatican II a, a new birthday for the church, a new Pentecost. Um, you know, he, he, he changed a lot of important doctrines when it comes to things like um, older brothers in the faith. And then he wanted feminism. Um, so I, I, I'm just I can't be with him. And he gave us this lie of mutual submission. It's on par with what what uh, Martin Luther did in Romans. He added a word. Mutual. It, 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 Tim, it's very interesting because um, I just I just. Pull up the Dewey Reams right now, Ephesians 5.21. It's, you're right. It says that the, the word mutual is not there. It says being subject one to another in the fear of Christ. 
So it doesn't say it doesn't say mutual submission. Ephesians 5:21 in the RSV be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So yeah, in both these translations the word mutual is not there. It's just saying exactly what, um, and again, I went through for Lent, I went through the entirety of scripture and I as it made it a project to, to, to really identify all the verses in scripture that talk specifically about women and women's roles. And it, it could not be clearer. I mean, all throughout Old Testament and New Testament, it is a consistent theme. There is no equivocation. There's no, well, mutual submit. It is very very clear. I think I identified somewhere among, you know, 50 to 70 verses where it just says like no, women, the husband is the boss, the man is the head. And that's the end of the story. There is no gray area about it. When we talk about in a modern context, we hear submit and then we're like, oh, see, each person is submissive. No, it's just it's just it means you're giving to the person what is due. It doesn't mean that you guys are equal and what you're giving sense. to each other. That yeah. makes sense. <laughs> makes complete sense. My mind just exploded. Bam. Because I've always had the John Paul, the second thought of mutual submission, but you're right. Uh, the, 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 the verses following that it gives this order within the marital construct. And so Ephesians 5:21 seems to be this mutual submission seems to be out of order. <laughs> <laughs> 